My name is Christoph Bruch from Helmholtz <coughs> Association. Um, I'm here in uh, uh, my function as the co-chair of the RDA Codata um, Legal Interoperability Interest Group. It's a very complicated name. I'm going to explain it a, a, a little bit. Um, the purpose um, of my um, of my presentation today is to introduce to you um, a document which has also a complicated name. Um, is, these are the principles and implementation guidelines concerning the legal interoperability of research uh, data. Um, so the, it sounds very complicated, but I hope at least um, that some of the things I'm going to present to you are less complicated than what we just learned um, about data protection, right, which truly is very complicated. I'll start out with uh, saying a few words about the Research Data Alliance. Um, I have seen uh, some familiar faces in the audience, but uh, many of uh, you who participate in this uh, meeting today may not participate in the Research Data Alliance, so I'll uh, shortly explain a little bit about the Research Data um, Alliance. It has been launched in 2013. You can, you can read with me if you want. It has about 5,000 members, which means individuals who sign up on the website. So each and everybody uh, can just sign up. It doesn't cost anything. Um, and if you sign up, you can participate um, in any of the, uh, of the meetings and you can join uh, working groups. And um, these working groups are really um, the focus of the Research Data Alliance. So people come together, um, they find a topic relating to research data, um, and uh, they start, there. there is a process, uh, a very informal process, and you can have a, uh, a working group. Um, <clears throat> and of course, each of the working groups um, is expected to deliver some kind of outcome, and the outcome of the legal operability working group is the legal interoperability paper. So that's a kind of a was a close match. Um, okay, so a little bit about the um, legal interoperability group. It's, um, it's a the, the name has a combination at the beginning of the Research Data Alliance and CODATA. The acronym um, is explained below, um, which of course is a, uh, a sub-organization of the International Council um, for science, so that this was a very, very important connection for us because, and now I come to the legal interoperability paper, the paper we have produced addresses scientists, yes, but it mainly addresses policymakers. So why are the International Council of Science, uh, we hope to reach many research organizations. So now about, um, the paper, um, Principles and Guidelines on the Legal Operability of Research Data. Um, research, making research data available for reuse means you have to find ways to overcome several hurdles. There are technical barriers, there are legal barriers, um, there are financial barriers, and if you look at the legal barriers, Data protection you know, is one big thing, liability law, um, and then, of course, property law. Within the group, we only looked at property law. So what you will learn today will um, not give you a complete overview of all kinds of possible uh, hurdles concerning um, the use of uh, research data. Um, it will be focused on property law, um, but we, we know that, um, that that is the case and that we do need more papers, if you will, to address all these various different legal areas. Okay, this is, so let's start with the principles. The document um, I will introduce um, has uh, six principles. We promote six principles, the first of which is that you should give um, lawful access and you should facilitate lawful access and research and reuse of research data. Uh, it sounds very simple. As a matter of fact, as a policy uh, criteria, it's not simple. 
um, many organizations will not have a rule saying um, that research data produced at their organization uh, should be made available for access and reuse as a default. So that is a very basic policy decision and it does not mean that you need to make everything available. Uh, we heard about the principle before, as open as possible, as closed as necessary. So openness is always a relative openness. But one of the main decisions um, to take when building a policy is whether the default is open or whether the default is closed. And uh, it, the decision in one direction or the other direction also shifts the burden of proof. If you start uh, with a decision that the information should be closed, then someone who would like to make his information available would need to legitim legitim legitimize that. If you start uh, with the openness, people who do not want to make their information available have to legitimize why they do not want to make it available or why they only make it partly available or whether they uh, need to attach conditions to that. Um, and I can assure you, I am um, active in, uh, in many uh, committees and a lot of people say it's naive um, to have openness as the default rule because they think about um, business cases that involve the control of information and they fear that too much openness will harm these business cases. And uh, that's a that's a very uh, important argument, an argument that is usually not considered enough um, in, uh, in meetings like the meeting here, um, but I think um, that is something we have to consider, and I'm still arguing argue for the um, openness as a default, but we have to be aware that there are very good arguments um, to keep things um, closed or only open them to a certain extent. Then, once you have a decision, possibly, that you do want to make um, your information available, then the next question is how you facilitate the, uh, how you support making the reuse possible um, to, a, to a large extent. Um, one consideration is whether to attach a certain um, license to the data. We already heard that um, there is a, a problem with the concept of ownership in respect to data. So, um, if we believe that data we would like to make available is protected by an um, intellectual property right, then a license would be an appropriate uh, legal instrument to make it available if we believe that the data we would like to make available is not covered by an intellectual property right, then um, an, a dedication, putting it, so to say, in the public domain or affirming that it isn't that the information are in the public domain, is in the public domain, would be an appropriate uh, legal measure, uh, legal instrument for that. Also, um, if you consider to make data available, um, we think it's important that the availability um, is granted on an equal basis so that um, everybody um, has the same ability to access the data and you don't just open it uh, to certain audiences. So what I just said to you, oops, that is, oops, yeah, that, is, uh, um, that is the text. I just didn't want to show you all the text so yet you keep reading all the uh, uh, time. The second principle um, is actually um, the most demanding, determining the rights and responsibility for the data. No matter what you would like to do with the research data, you have to determine the per, who, who, which person or which organization has the right to decide what is done with the data. 
That's a, a crucial decision. Um, if you look at it from a legal perspective, you, you do need to control, is that my, no. Uh, you do need to control, um, you, you do need to know who owns or controls um, the data. This is the person who can decide. And checking on this is probably too complicated for most of the scientists. So it's a part of the responsibility of a research organization to have clear rules and to clearly negotiate um, who can do what with the research data that are produced within a research project taking place at a certain research organization, um, or research data which are produced um, or possibly bought from, uh, from another entity um, in the course of having a research project. Um, one important aspect um, in this respect is that if you acquire data from um, another entity during the research project, you need to check the contract because um, if you buy satellite data, satellite data for example, um, within the research project, um, and then there may be restrictions connected if you, you know, get a license to use these data, so you need to check uh, what the restrictions are in order to then know what you can do if you want to make the research data of your project available. As I mentioned before, there are reasons to make data available and there are reasons to not make them available. So we ask in principle number three that you balance these interests. Um, that also sounds easy but um, can be a quite a complicated process. Um, because if you, if you talk to policymakers in uh, research organizations, they will be aware um, of an interest in openness and of an interest uh, in confidentiality. But um, setting up a process to balance that is not easy. Um, there are several uh, uh, ways one could um, go about that. Um, you can have a uh, you, you can set up a committee, for example, that looks at this. Uh, you can have certain rules concerning the justification of con confidentiality. Um, most importantly, I think, is you do need to have um, a transparent process so that you understand why certain data are made available or are not made available. Once you have decided um, that you do want to make data available for reuse uh, um, by third parties, you need to communicate what people may do or may not do with these data. Now, it's very important that you communicate and state the rights as transparently and as clearly as possible. Um, you may be able to find a lot of data in the internet, but usually you will find very little information telling you what you may or may not do with these data. From a legal point of view, um, that's a very unfortunate situation. If you collect data from different sources um, and you also would enable to, 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 to uh, enable the reuse of that new data set. It, you need to know what you are allowed to do with the data um, to, you know, to keep on communicating that. So we have a real issue here at hand that as of now, data are made available in many cases, but often there's no clear policy um, communicated, no clear license or dedication information communicated. Um, we from the Legal Interoperability uh, Group believe that the best, probably the best way as of now to communicate this uh, um, legal situation of the data is the use of the CC licenses. 
Of course, the CC licenses um, have different flavors. So we, I'm referring to the CC0 license in this respect and the uh, CC BY license. Um, the CC0 license would apply if you believe that the data are not copyright protected and the CC BY license would apply if you believe um, that the data are copyright protected. And I will not go into details of how to determine whether uh, data are copyright protected or not because that can only be decided on a case-by-case -case, um, analysis. Generally speaking, the question is whether it's a work in the sense, so a creative work in the sense of, of copyright. And I think if we talk about data, in most of the cases we actually talk um, about um, just pieces of information which are not, um, they, are the res they can be the result of a lot of creative work, but the, um, the information itself is not a creation. It's in many cases an observation. I already referred to the CC BY group um, of licenses, and that communicates to the um, principle number five, promote the harmonization of rights in research data. Now, that is, this um, principle is clearly addressing the policy makers. Um, I applaud the European Commission for having started um, the uh, open research data pilot and making it uh, the default now. This is a typical step of trying to harmonize how we deal with research data. Um, the, uh, the publishing community is another important player and just before, the, uh, before this, uh, this meeting here, um, I looked um, at uh, some principles of the uh, uh, many uh, publishers adhere to when they publish research data. And uh, I went through all the principles and there's nothing about the legal aspects in these principles. So I was a bit shocked by that. Uh, so I think the publishers uh, need to think about that too. Um, so we have, of course, there are several um, aspects of the harmonization. Um, Part of the harmonization will be to have a um, common policy, for example, um, concerning embargo periods, um, but also, of course, what kind of licenses um, are appropriate so um, people um, kind of don't have to have too complicated decision-making processes each and every time they want to make data available. And the very last um, of the um, principles provides proper attribution and credit for research data. That's very important and uh, strictly speaking, it's not part of the legal interoperability, at least not um, if you're referring to data which are not copyright protected. If you believe that um, the data you're making available are not copyright protected, if you make them available, um, usually um, people can do with the data what they want and they do not need to cite the source. So from the, from, from the legal point of view, this, there may be not a strict necessity uh, to cite the source. But uh, from the scientific point of view, of course, it's very important uh, to cite the source. So um, we strongly argue um, that people do cite sources and um, that actually today I think um, can be a technical hurdle because if you would like to combine uh, information from many different sources, it's sometimes quite complicated um, to find an adequate way um, to um, provide the attribution information. For example, for this presentation, um, I looked for pictures uh, yesterday. I found all these pictures in the internet. Um, in my presentation, I have an extra slide that mentions all the sources, but there's no elegant way, at least for my technical ability, um, to embed um, the source information in the picture in a way 
you can see it right now because it's not important during the presentation, but if I make the presentation available later, you could easily uh, find that information. For me, it's a lot of work, so I have to uh, put together all of that. Um, and imagine um, I want to combine uh, many sources, then it becomes really very complicated. So I strongly believe that the, uh, the ability to properly attribute um, needs, uh, needs technical uh, support uh, much more than uh, what is available right now. Um, after presenting the six uh, principles, I would like to ask you to have a closer look at your document. It's quite a big document, it's 40 pages, so it's actually for the policy makers, but I think many of you are uh, uh, in this uh, position. Um, to read more closely all the explanations we have about the principles and then possibly um, make this paper available to the leadership of your organization and ask them to consider whether they would like um, to support um, this, um, these principles. Um, I just got the information about a website, which was not ready until uh, uh, a few days ago, um, where you can sign and you can say, I support these principles and I will make um, the link available and give it to the organizers so they can make it available together with the uh, presentation. Uh, so there will be an option for, for individuals and for uh, organizations uh, to show their support for the principles. Um, we strongly believe that we, that we do need organizations uh, to subscribe either to, to these principles or other principles if you find others, but I think um, at the moment they are the only ones, in order to build a consensus about how we should legally deal uh, with research data. Now this is the first version of that paper. We hope and believe that a conversation will build on this paper. People will have comments and there can be future versions that accommodate um, aspects that may not be covered in the paper yet or we may change certain things because people say this or that um, is not dealt with adequately uh, in the paper. But I think um, the paper is a very good start for a conversation to build consensus concerning um, the legal um, aspects of making data um, available and uh, making them available for reuse. Thank you very much for your attention. So we have time for one question and then later we, you can if you want to do one question now, we have time, and then later we have the panel discussion. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask about uh, why do you advise not to use CC0 for data where there is copyright protection in it? Uh, is there any risk that we take doing that? Uh, you said you advise not to use CC0 but only CC BY for data where there is copyright protection in the data. What would be the reason for this? Why would CC0 be a wrong solution? Uh, do, we, do we take any special risks if we do that? No, oh, no it works, yeah. So uh, the reason is um, if the, you know, from, from the legal point of view, if the, if the data are not copyright protected, then um, you, cannot, uh, you, you, you cannot own them. If you cannot own them, you cannot license them. You can only give information about the status. So um, that would be, um, if, if they're not protected, you could attach zero or um, the um, PDDL license. That is an, another option. If they are uh, copyright uh, protected, then um, you are right, in theory you can, you could um, also use the CC0, but that is of course then very much dependent 
on the um, copyright law um, of the, in the various countries. Um, so you're not able to waive certain rights um, depending on where you, where you live. So for that, you know, I didn't go in, in, into the details in, in this respect. Then um, uh, the, the CC BY license is the second best, but we agree and um, maybe I was not clear enough about that. A CC zero um, license, if you want to call that a license, it's not a real license, uh, would be the preferred option but whether you can use it or not is dependent on the legal situation uh, you are in. Um, and also, um, and I'm referring to data which are copyright protected, many researchers uh, would like to use the CC BY license because they feel, and it really is a feeling, <laughs> because they feel that if they use the CC BY license, there's a stronger incentive to cite, which in practice I think is not the case, but um, it's very difficult com to communicate to a researcher audience to use a CC zero uh, license. For them, it sounds like saying their data is not worth much, which of course I'm not saying. But it's, uh, it's always a very difficult argument to tell someone who has worked possibly years to produce a data set and say, it's not protected. <laughs> yeah, very difficult. 